Good evening, uh, good evening to everybody. Welcome to this presentation. For you on by welcome. My name is Davi Ruth. I'm the chief economist at the Efficient Group, and this is a presentation about the budget. We call it the money is finished and klar. What now? Now what? But before I get to this presentation, I, I must thank Francois uh, that, and of course Wilhelmin. Most of this was put together this afternoon after the speech of the Minister of, Hans, of, of Minister of Finance. So bye, thank you, Francois. Yeah, and Wilhelmin, Wilhelmin, I greet you guys. Okay, you will see at the bottom of the presentation. You will see now. You will have the opportunity to ask questions. So if there are any questions, as opposed to the questions there, Francois will put everything together. And after the presentation, he will he will put the questions to me, and hopefully I will be able to answer the questions. So Francois will do all of that. And I, let me get going with the presentation. Because there's a very important uh, code that I want to uh, share with you. And there's the code. That code, take your telephone, take your phone, your telephone, and take a picture of this code, of this QR code. If you take the picture of this QR code, it will take you through to a website where you will be able to get the whole presentation and much more. So just take a picture of this at the end of the presentation. I will give you the opportunity to take a picture of this code again. So remember, any questions, the Q and Q and A at the bottom. Any questions, just post the questions there and Francois will get all the questions together. And after the presentation, I will try to answer those. Okay, let's get going. Now, I just, before we get to the budget and some announcements in the budget, it's important to understand what is going on in the world. So this is just a few views and a few things that I think are important in the world and what's going on in the world. So let's just go through some of these. Of course, the war in Ukraine, it's exactly, in two days' time, it will be exactly one year since the beginning of that war. It is still impacting on the world economy. The Russian economy, initially, I thought that the Russian economy will really collapse. As it turns out, the Russian economy is not doing that badly, but a little bit more on that. Taiwan issue is still unresolved. That can lead to a potential conflict internationally as well. There's some interesting things, interesting stuff happening in India. I'll talk a little bit about that. China is reopening. Scotland, new changes there. The first minister has just resigned. There's a new first minister, or soon will be. And that leaves some questions as far as Scotland is concerned, and of course the European Union. Latin or Latin America is swinging politically to the left. That has some implications. Inter internationally, I think inflation or the worst of inflation is probably behind us. And then one has to say something about the miraculous U.S. economy. The U.S. economy is just an absolutely amazing economy. They just keep on surprising to the upside. All right, so let's get going. It's a year now. And the Ukrainian war is still going on. Uh, what has happened the past year is that they will, when you talk about Ukraine, it, many people, including uh, President Putin, did not consider Ukraine to be a country. But a year later, this is a country. There is a new nationalism in Ukraine, and the resistance provided by, by the Ukrainians really surprised everybody. So a new country, in a way, has been born. Uh, European, the US and the European Union continue to support. Uh, Ukraine, I have, I'm quite concerned that this conflict can escalate, especially now in the spring. There seem to be new uh, movement on the, on the, from the Russian side as well as from the Ukrainian side. So I think we could see more conflict there. And I'm also concerned that this conflict may eventually suck in other countries in the world. But let's assume that it's not going to get other countries involved in this conflict in Ukraine, because if it does, it can things can really start getting ugly. The Russian economy surprised the Russian economy. Initially, I thought the Russian economy will contract by as much as 10%. The contraction now seems to be around about 2% or so. So the Russians are in a recession, but much less than previously expected. I must say that the central banker, and I'm not going to try to pronounce her name, but the central, their central bank is doing, and given circumstances, uh, an excellent job. So increase interest rates quite dramatically at the beginning of the conflict, and that stabilized the ruble amongst others. So they, their central bank is doing an excellent job. Over time, however, 
I think the Russian economy will keep on suffering. They're running out of spare parts for machine for airplanes and spare parts for computers and things like that. And over time, I think the Russian economy, uh, because of sanctions, uh, will will suffer, but perhaps less than what we previously thought. Uh, of course, the winter in in Europe is much milder and previously well than uh, than uh, feared. So a fairly mild, warm winter in Europe, and that means that energy prices. Uh, came down quite quite dramatically, I think one can say. And then there's a the possibility that China could get involved. Most recent rumors suggest that China may start providing Russians with the weapons. The Americans made it very clear that they're very unhappy about that. Uh, so, so there are quite a lot of threat or potential con uh, threats that can really get this thing moving in the wrong direction in Europe. Some other issues, uh, Taiwan is still unresolved, and that can be a new flashpoint politically, internationally. China, uh, India is rising. I, I think India is going to be the next great global economic growth engine for the world economy. Uh, the Indian population will, this year, in two months' time, the Indian population will be bigger than the Chinese population. I think the Indian economy is really going to take off soon. They in, radio, in fact, they've already taken off. And it decides the, the Indian population being bigger than the Chinese uh, population now is the first time ever. The Chinese economy recently started opening up after COVID. Uh, that's part of the reason why one should be quite positive about Chinese economic growth. And something else that is happening, it's just happened in China, is that their population is actually declining. Population growth is negative, And that is likely to weigh on Chinese economic growth for many years to come. Think of Japan as an example. Talking about Japan, about um, there's a new central bank in Japan. The Japanese do something what is called yield curve control. Essentially, the central bank is targeting the long end of the yield curve for long-term interest rates, and they're gradually moving away from that. And that thing can unravel, uh, uh, and it can have a negative impact on the world especially the capital markets international. Keep an eye on, on, on that as well. That can be a potential threat to the world capital markets as well. A couple of other things. Scotland will be getting a new first minister. Uh, if there's a referendum and they're trying to push for another referendum, chances are quite good that Scotland could leave the union. That will really make life very difficult for the Brits. The British economy, as it is, is already in a recession, quite a deep recession. Scotland uh, obviously will rejoin the European Union if that should happen. Latin America is, swim, is swinging to the left politically, uh, especially after the election of Lula in Brazil. Lula is going to be much nicer to Maduro. And if he's nicer to Maduro, there will likely to be less sanctions on Venezuela. And I think the Venezuelans will start pumping more oil, and that will contribute to a lower oil price. Of course, there are many other factors. But that's one of the reasons why I think that the oil price is likely to gradually drift lower over the next couple of months or so. Inflation, I think the worst on inflation is over internationally and locally as well. And that means that interest rates could go up a little bit further internationally, especially in the United States. But I think the worst is probably behind us. And talking about the United States, the US economy is a miraculous economy, a miracle economy. The economy just keeps on uh, roaring ahead. Unemployment levels are the lowest since the 1960s, and uh, they keep on creating more, more, more jobs. So I think the, the Fed will keep on increasing interest rates in the US until something breaks, and one of two things must break. Either inflation must break, that means inflation must start coming down quite sharply, or unemployment levels must go up. One of those th two things must happen before the Fed uh, stops on its current hiking cycle on interest rates. But uh, having said that, I think the worst is probably behind us. Okay, some estimates on economic growth globally. These are World Bank estimates, international growth, and uh, IMF estimates for global e economic growth. Global economic growth set at about 1.7% for this year, 2.7% for next year. And some e economies, I think the Chinese economy, for example, is expected to grow just over 4% this year. I think it's quite possible that we can see economic growth of around about 5% already this year for the Chinese economy. The European economy is probably going to grow a little bit stronger than 0.1% there. And the US economy is probably going to uh, grow faster than half a percent as well, depending, of course, 
and how much the Fed is going to increase interest rates. As far as inflation is concerned, Chinese inflation is an upward trajectory. European inflation, I think, is going to stabilize more or less at this level and then gradually start coming down a little bit, while the US inflation is likely to come down quite a lot. But what is important when you talk about inflation, especially international inflation, is that in the past we talk about infl inflation, global inflation of in the big economies of 2% or lower, what we're going to see likely, what we're likely to see from now onwards, uh, global inflation around about 4%. I don't think we're going to see 2% on in global inflation sustainably for a long time. Uh, so we, we had inflation in the past of around about 2%, expect global inflation around about 4% uh, soon. This is just a couple of slides on, on things like, for example, the various uh, commodity prices. I've picked a couple of commodities that I uh, would like to share with you. Uh, not all of them, of course, but a couple of commodities. Some of the commodities are the oil price, Brent oil. What is important, the uh, Brent oil price came down quite a lot recently. It will have certain implication, halting certain implications for, for example, this is energy, basically. That's good for the European economies. It's bad for the Russian economy. It's good for the South African economy uh, because this is our most important import product. But you look at some other commodities, like, for example, palladium. Palladium prices also come down, came down quite a lot. And coal prices also came down, recently came down quite a lot. Now, this will have some implications for state revenue, as an example, and I'll get to that a little bit later. State revenue doing very well this year, and this is unlikely to get another boost in a current, coming financial year because commodity prices are coming down quite a lot. This will have a, also have an impact on our current account, the difference between our imports and our exports, and it will have likely to have a negative impact on our current account. So commodity prices are coming down, good for inflation internationally and locally, generally speaking, but bad when it comes for, to South African exports, but good when you talk about South African inflation, if we look at the oil price as an example. So depending who you are, are you going to be affected by these change in commodity prices? Francois? Just want to go to the next slide. Okay, what's cooking in South Africa? A couple of things about South Africa. So that's a global environment. I looked at the political environment and I looked at the global economic environment. Let's have a look at what's going on in South Africa. A couple of things. I think what is important, uh, of course, is the election. Everything that we're going to see over the next couple of months will be about the election. And we've seen many, uh, a lot of electioneering happening already. Now, here are a couple of things. And this is what our president has said and what our president is supposed to be doing. So a couple of things about the president. The president did say, for example, that Suvetus and some of the other local authorities that their debt to Eskom must be written off. And I think that's an irresponsible thing to, to say. Eskom is financially very deep in trouble. It is wrong to write off debt because if you write off debt, they're not going to start paying debt anyway. We have to make some other plan. That is, that is just populism. Uh, the president also indicated that the uh, ESCOM should consider, consider not to increase the uh, the NERSA um, increase that NERSA allowed ESCOM to do. Uh, and the president said that's not the right time to increase electricity prices now. So if we don't ele increase electricity prices, what about ESCOM? Where are they going to get all this extra money? The president also announced the state of disaster. That's something that we have to be concerned about. Um, I would have preferred not a state of disaster when it gets to electricity, but rather business rescue for Eskom, uh, because that is what this is indeed a disaster. This is a crisis in which the South African economy, where we find ourselves at the moment, but a state of disaster, as far as I'm concerned, is not the right approach. We need to restructure Eskom and everything that goes with that. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Where's the new cabinet? I would have uh, liked to see the president announcing his new cabinet before the state of the nation because that would have actually proved the, whether he's going to be serious about tackling many problems in South Africa. I want, I want to see who his team is going to be, and perhaps more importantly, I want to see who's not going to be on part of his team, because there are a lot of dead wood in cabinet that he must get rid of. Then the minister is announcing a new, he will announce a new minister for electricity. Now, I don't understand this. We've got a minister of electricity, minister of state and enterprise, minister of, ele ele of uh, energy. We've got the, the deputy president that's, that's responsible for ESCOM. We've got a committee responsible for ESCOM. So everybody is responsible for ESCOM. That means nobody is going to be responsible for ESCOM. So I'm afraid this is just another 
minister with a black car and a deputy and secretaries and speed cops and all that. Uh, so clearly there are too many cooks in this generation room or too many electricians in this generation room. Private sector participation, that, that, that's it's an absolute must uh, for uh, ESCOM. And that's what the president also mentioned, that we're going to see more private sector participation, which means in a way it's a backdoor kind of way uh, of privatizing a lot of things in South Africa. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, it's the same old ANC, despite everything that they've been promising us for the last couple of years, nothing really changes. It's still the cadres. They're still committed to cadre deployment. There's still all these social and political objectives that are still important to the ANC. That's not going to change. Little progress and prosecutions or uh, on the Zondo uh, recommendations, although the Minister of Finance did make it clear today that more money will be available, especially uh, to implement the Zondo recommendations. So that indeed is a good news. Um, uh, I don't think the cabinet's going to, whoever is going to be in cabinet's going to change the current direction of the current cabinet that we have. So it's business as usual. That means collapse of infrastructure, which is really uh, having a huge impact on the South African economy. Crime, we just saw what's been happening to crime in South Africa. Crime levels are up again. I hope he gets rid of CELEP. Corruption levels are very, very high and likely to remain high in South Africa. And of course, as always, service uh, delivery lacks in South Africa. I don't think much will be changing as far as that is concerned. People are restless. We have to be concerned about this. Uh, I think we're heading for a new political era in South Africa. That means that the ANC is likely to get less than 50% in the elections. The ANC is aware of that. Minister of Finance is aware of this. The president is aware of this. So expect much more politics over the next couple of months and political posturing as well. I think we're going to see coalition governments from now on. That in itself will have certain cha challenges. The ANC and EFF, that could be a, a possible coalition. The ANC and others, that's another possibility. If the ANC gets less than 45%, it's probably going to be an ANC-EFF coalition. If the ANC gets 45% or more, it can be ANC and a couple of other smaller political parties. It's not impossible, but very unlikely that we can see a government without the ANC. Chances are the ANC is probably going to be part of government again. Will the ANC accept the results? That, of course, is a different question. Remember all these states of disasters. If we see some public uh, violence, for example, there could be another state of disaster. And who knows, a government could uh, govern by decree in South Africa. Let's hope the ANC is going to accept this. This is the real test for South Africa's democracy next year. People are impatient. We have got exceptionally high levels of unemployment, as we are all aware of. Poverty in South Africa, especially absolute poverty, is rising in South Africa. It means people are going to be hungry, and we see more and more protests in South Africa. And I'm concerned that's going to go, that we're going to see more of that. This is just a graph on South Africa's unemployment levels. Recently, we've seen a bit of an improvement on unemployment, and that is basically the economy getting back to pre-COVID times. Uh, but uh, even before COVID, we, it's very clear that unemployment was moving in the wrong direction. So rising levels of unemployment, currently unemployment, this is the narrow definition and standing in excess of 30% in South Africa. Just some protests in South Africa for the past say, two years or so uh, in South Africa, protests for various reasons in South Africa. At the beginning of the year, typically one see protests because of education. Uh, parents can't find schools for the kids, for example. You get all sort of education-related protests, but we also get uh, protests that are related to things like, for example, crime and service delivery and lack of electricity and so on. This is a graph indicating where protests are mainly happening. Uh, can look at that part, the KZN, that is where we saw that ugly protest two years ago, and we see all these very smaller protests there more and more. We see that also in Gauteng area and in the northern part uh, of, uh, of South Africa, Limpopo and Pumalanga, those areas. So those are the potential flashpoints in the country if something goes really wrong in terms of public violence. So those are the places where one could expect public violence breaking out uh, if we don't soon turn this economy around. Okay, what I've done here, so who should you vote for? So I'm going to make life a little bit easier for you. And I've 
I've drawn up a list on the left-hand side of macroeconomic policies that I will be in favor of if I had the opportunity. These are my macroeconomic policies. You can compare this to the various political parties. You can compare that to the ANC as well. But the first thing that you must do, you must protect private property rights. That is an absolute must. Because without the protection of private property rights, you cannot get free lunches. And you get free lunches by free trade between individuals. And you cannot trade if you don't own something. So you must protect private property rights in order for people to trade. And once people trade, you create free lunches because the buyer and the seller both gain from a free trade. So free trade is crucial. Now, the ANC, we know in both cases, uh, make life quite difficult for, for, for individuals in terms of protection of private property rights and also free trade. Privatization, that's another one. The state is just not good at doing stuff. So we need to privatize. And in a weird way, we are privatizing in South Africa, but not in a normal way. Uh, we privatize it because the state and enterprises are just dying. They are slowly dying. In a way, that is privatization. We need law and order. We don't have that. See, uh, look, have a look at the uh, most recent crime stats in South Africa. Again, Sele must be fired. We have to prioritize primary education, especially primary education. If you compare South Africa uh, to the rest of the world, and there are certain studies done, the Pearl study, for example, the TIM study, which clearly shows that South Africa's quality of our education is not only bad, it's quite often the worst in the world. Prioritize primary education. That is extremely important. Professionalize the civil service. Professionalize the civil service. Get rid of cadres and get people that can actually do the job. Uh, certain uh, infrastructural development and maintenance, I see certain uh, or selected infrastructural development and maintenance, like, for example, typical typical collective goods, highways, as an example, these high, these um, uh, the high pylons used by ESCOM, that's another example of a typical collective goods. So that is what the state is supposed to provide. But for the rest, you have to privatize that. Stabilize the fiscal accounts. We're going to look at the fiscal account just now. And you will see that we are in deep trouble. Achieve a correct energy security. What I mean by that, in a case of ESCOM as an example, uh, what we're doing in, with ESCOM, this is not a proper plan. I'm going to give you some financial uh, relief. I'll give you some information about financial relief announced by the Minister of Finance. But this is not a proper ESCOM plan. What needs to happen to ESCOM is that we have to restructure ESCOM. Uh, that means that m many thousands of people will probably lose their jobs that means also that we have to sell off a lot of assets of ESCOM. We must get private sector participation. We must get those people that still owe ESCOM money, including those various uh, local authorities, to pay the money that they owe. Those are the kind of things that we need to do in order to fix ESCOM. And I'm afraid politicians are not prepared to take these sort of steps because there's an election around the corner. And ideologically, they don't want to do it in any event. Uh, and then lower inflation. I would like to see lower inflation. The uh, reserve uh, low inflation targets. The Reserve Bank, uh, in fact, is also in fa favor of lower inflation targets. Currently, we've got three to six percent is inflation targets. I would like to see that uh, down to a point target, preferably around about three percent. So a point target of three percent, and I would also like to see a, to a total abolition of all forms of foreign exchange regulations. If I want to take money out of the country, I have to apply for that. Like a child, I have to apply to take my money after I pay taxes to take it out of the country. And I'm, I'm not allowed to do that. Get rid of all foreign exchange regulations. And I can't understand why the other opposition political parties are not doing much about this. Just a couple of uh, economic numbers, most recent economic numbers coming from out of South Africa. Economic growth in the third quarter, that's the most recent numbers, 1.6% in South Africa. Expect the fourth quarter to show a contraction, but still the economy is likely to do better than Previously thought in during 2022, we're waiting for the final numbers, and I'm going to get some number, some reasons for that. Inflation currently 6.9%. I think the worst of inflation is behind us. Uh, there could be a bit of a hiccup, but things like, for example, another petrol price increase can be expected soon. And of course, the effect of higher electricity prices will also filter through to higher inflation as well. But the gradual trajectory for inflation over the next couple of months is probably lower. Uh, the repo rate currently is seven and a quarter percent. I think the Reserve Bank, and I hope the Reserve Bank is going to increase interest rates by, I would guess, another 25 pips or so, bringing the repo up to seven and a half percent. But I think the worst is behind us. And from now on, uh, inflation is likely to drift lower. And that means that the Reserve Bank may have some, some space to cut interest rates again by the second half of this year. I, th I think we must all support the South African Reserve Bank. 
uh, trying to get inflation lower. The South African Reserve Bank uh, interest rates is a blunt instrument. It's causing a lot of damage to the economy, but that's all that we have left. Uh, the alternative should have been fixing electricity, as an example, create more a more competitive environment. Those are the th kind of things that we should have done. But since our pol political leaders can't do that, all that is left is for, for the Reserve Bank to use this blunt instrument called interest rates. And Lesetje Kanyahu is doing an excellent job there. So we all have to support the Reserve Bank in trying to get inflation lower. Inflation is a horrible thing. It's much better to have high short-term interest rates than to have for a short period of time than to have high inflation for a long period of time. The exchange rate of the currency, 1822, the most recent that I've had a look at, the rand seems to be on the back foot, a little bit weaker. After the budget of the Minister of Finance, it weakened a little bit. 10-year bonds currently are just over 11%. All right, this is the minister's estimates for the economy. I'm not going to go through all of this. And remember that QR code, you can get the presentation there and you can go through it uh, in your own time. Uh, maybe just a couple of numbers that I think are important. GDP, look at GDP numbers. So for, the, for 2022, the minister expects economic growth of 2.5% and he brings it down to 0.9% for 2023. And if I have to criticize the minister of finance, I think he's far too optimistic. I think economic growth in 2023 is likely to be closer to zero. It's a good possibility that we can see the economy actually dipping into a recession. In fact, the most uh, recent estimates by the South African Reserve Bank, they expect economic growth at 0.3% for this year. And the leading indicator of the Reserve Bank that was released yesterday suggests that the economy could be heading for a recession or could be in a recession already. Then the minister expects economic growth to bounce back to 1.5% and then 1.8% for subsequent years. I don't think so. I don't think we're going to see that kind of economic growth. Economic growth is likely to remain uh, under pressure for the next until we fix many things, including electricity. But uh, for 2023, unlikely to receive 1% uh, what the Minister of Finance is basically expecting. That means that the revenue of the Minister of Finance is likely to be under pressure and to come in below estimates. Remember, there's an overrun of revenue collections now because of high commodity prices, but commodity prices are coming down and a weak economic growth also means that the economy is simply not in a position where they can contribute much to the fiscus. Inflation, I agree broadly with the Minister of Finance on inflation, uh, and I think inflation is likely to drift lower, lower, lower over the next couple of months. In fact, I'm a little bit more optimistic because of weak economic growth. The current account is likely to dip into a negative this year and subsequent years as well for reasons already mentioned, like, for example, the commodity cycle. So broadly speaking, I agree with that. If you look at these numbers, the most important number where I think the Minister is missing uh, missing or get a number wrong, and that is GDP growth. I think economic growth over the next couple of years and in 2023 is going to disappoint. And with the population growing at between one and one and a half percent, it's very clear that on a per capita basis, we will be getting poorer over the next couple of years. Talking about per capita GDP, this is South Africa's per capita GDP compared to the rest of the world since 1994. Uh, I've, what I've done here in the calculations, or rather Wilhelmin, what she's done, we kept the world per capita GDP constant, and that's that 100 line, and the blue line is South Africa. And as you can quite clearly see, we have been getting poorer relative to the rest of the world. We have always been poorer than the rest of the world on an average basis, but now we even slip even further. And the most recent numbers are not available yet, but it's very clear with these kind of GDP numbers, per capita GDP is also likely to keep on falling. Electricity generation. Now, we all know what's going on with electricity. If you go back a little bit before 1994, South Africa actually generated more electricity on a per capita basis than compared to the rest of the world. But clearly what's been happening, currently we generate about 65% of the world's on a per capita basis electricity, and it will continue to fall. Here is a very interesting calculation that we've done. And this is basically how much GDP that we generate in South Africa with a given electricity uh, consumption. Uh, and uh, for example, we, this is on an index basis. Uh, today, we generate about 130 GDP units uh, for normal per, per unit of electricity consumed compared to 100 uh, in 2020, 20, uh, 2007. 2007. Basically, what it, what it means, two things. One is that we are using electricity much, much more efficient in South Africa. 
So there's a productivity increase as far as electricity consumption is concerned. That is one. And the other one is that we're moving away from ESCOM because these are ESCOM numbers. So we're moving away from ESCOM and people are uh, generating their own electricity. Expect this number to keep on going up. ESCOM is slowly becoming less re relevant uh, to the South African economy. So two, two, two good pieces of uh, information here. A better electricity usage, usage just goes to show if something becomes scarcer and more expensive, we use it more sparingly. That's one. And the other one is we're generating a lot of electricity for our own consumption as well. This is our current account. Uh, you clearly want to see our current account surplus that we had the past two years. That's coming to an end. The current account will dip into a negative now. It will have certain implications. Uh, one is, of course, is that the commodity cycle is slowly coming to an end or slowing down at least. Revenue of the Minister of Finance is likely to come under a lot of pressure. And uh, with the current account dipping into a negative, that means that the, the currency Durant is also likely to suffer because of this. We so expect Durant to be under some pressure uh, over the next time with the current account dipping into a recession. Uh, this is just uh, the interest rates and inflation in South Africa. Inflation, you can clearly see inflation recently. I think it's we've over the worst. That's the red line. It's likely to keep on drifting lower now. In the meantime, the Reserve Bank increased interest rates quite a bit. And currently we have in real terms and compared to this specific uh, inflation rate, we've got a real inflation or real interest rates basically at zero. I think inflation will continue to fall. There's a possibility for further rate increase by the Reserve Bank pushing interest rates into real into a, a real positive territory. Economic growth, these are our estimates for economic growth. We expect economic growth last year. We're waiting for the final numbers at 2.4% for 2022. This year, we basically expect no economic growth with the possibility of the economy actually dipping into a recession. And for next year, who knows? It's anybody's guess, but uh, let's call it a half a percent of economic growth unless we can fix the electricity problems. And of course, that is not going to happen. And also keep in mind, next year is going to be the election. And if there's a change in government, that in itself is disruptive. Uh, uh, even if everything goes peacefully, changing government is, especially for a country like South Africa, is usually disruptive. Okay, a couple of the fiscal setting. Let's just understand what's going on with the, with the fiscus in South Africa. When I say when I call something the fiscus, I refer to the fiscal accounts or what the minister of finance is responsible for. We've been seeing an increase in the tax burden in South Africa for many many years. It will go. It will continue to happen, and the reason for that is simply because. Politicians like to spend a lot of money. Politicians, they say if we all pay our taxes, they, they, we all will be paying less. That's a lie. If we all pay our taxes, they're simply going to spend more. That's how it works in the real life. Uh, we've had quite a nice windfall in taxes last year and the year before because of the strong commodity cycle. So uh, tax revenue in the current financial year, which will only it will only the end end the end of March. So we are still busy with the current financial year. Uh, so there's a, quite a nice windfall and tax uh, collections because of the commodity cycle and the year before. But like I've mentioned earlier, that commodity cycle is coming to an end. The tax base in South Africa is very, very narrow. That means few people pay just about all the tax. I'm going to show you just now. The economy is very weak. I expect zero economic growth this year. There's huge demand. Uh, on the social spending on the Minister of Finance. I'm going to give you some numbers on that. Uh, the, the More than 60% of the total spending of the Minister of Finance goes to social spending in any event. The state is highly uh, dissaving. The state is the high destroyer of capital. I'm going to show you some numbers on that. The state-owned enterprises are collapsing, just about all of them. One or two, SAFCOL is one that is actually reporting a, a profit, but for the rest, most of, most of them are financially and operationally have been run into the ground. And the debt trajectory is unsustainable. The Minister of Finance tells us he's going to stabilize that. Uh, but every year he moves that trajectory upwards. So I don't think it's necessarily going to happen. All right. Uh, this graph just shows the red line is state spending as a percentage of GDP and the bottom line is state revenue or tax collections as a percentage of GDP. The gap between the two is a fiscal deficit and that's how much the state needs to borrow every year to balance the books. The, the dotted line uh, after the dotted line are the estimates of the Minister of Finance. And clearly, you can see the Minister of Finance is expecting state spending to come down relative to the size of the economy. But keep in mind, this is with fairly optimistic estimates on the size of the economy and also with the assumption that certain expense items will be kept 
uh, in check, which I doubt. And I'll get to that a little bit later. The bottom line, state revenue. State revenue, of course, is also a function of economic growth. If the economy doesn't grow, an increase in state revenue uh, will come under pressure. So state revenue will come under pressure and as well as the commodity cycle. So there is a lot of very optimistic estimates in these uh, numbers of the Minister of Finance. Okay, these are the actual numbers of the Minister of Finance. Uh, for the medium term over the next three years or so. Let me go through some of the numbers. Perhaps one number to look at, look at the revenue number, the, the just below the revenue number, the, the revenue as a percentage of the GDP. Uh, you can see, for example, in 23, 24, the minister expects the revenue as a percentage of GDP to be 28%. And thereafter, it uh, to, maintain, to be maintained roughly up 28% to GDP. Now, Actually, there's a possibility that that can be higher. And the reason for that is because of a smaller GDP or a smaller economy. On the expense side, and this is that what really concerns me, if the Minister of Finance is concerned about too much state spending, then that 32% as uh, relative to GDP is not supposed to come down to 31.7% and 31.2%. He must reduce that by 1% or 2% annually in order uh, to really cut back on state spending. What the minister did in his, in his budget is to actually to reduce discretionary spending in real terms. But if you add interest to that, then spending keeps on going up, actually, or interest uh, spending remains relatively high. On the fiscal deficit, the deficit is basically the difference between spending and revenue. The minister expects, and this is uh, the consolidated fiscal deficit, by the way, uh, the minister expects a deficit around about 4%, that come bringing that down to 3.8% and then 3.2%. In an environment with, we with very weak economic growth, a fiscal deficit uh, with this magnitude, it means that the fiscus is actually highly expansionary. So the state is spending far too much money. So this is not a restrictive budget. This is an expansionary budget and uh, quite a, a significant expansionary budget. The minister, with running these kinds of fiscal deficits, it means that the budget is quite expansionary. This is some numbers uh, on major spending items that the Minister of Finance announced today. I'm not going to go through all of those. I just want to highlight one or two. Community development, that's basically the local authorities. They will be getting quite a lot of extra money. One can understand that because the local authorities, well, 70% of the local authorities are financially just not viable. So the local authorities are really start weighing on the Minister of Finance on the central government accounts quite a lot. Go down a little bit and you will see there's a number, there's a, an item called debt service cost. That's basically interest on state debt and debt service cost is going to go up by 8.9% uh, over the next couple of years. On average, 8.9%. That is a massive increase, which simply means that because of the rising debt levels of the state, interest on state debt keeps on going up. The number just above that, that's total state expenditure where the Minister of Finance expects discretionary expenditure to go to increase, in fact, less than 3%, which is well below the inflation rate. But I think there are there's a lot of risks involved in that specific one. I'll get to that a little bit later. But the interest component increasing by nearly 9% over the next couple of months simply means that the, the interest component, the rising interest component is, is, is squeezing uh, the rest of the budget. In total, the budget is expected to increase total spending by 4.5% on average over the next couple of years, which I think is also a little bit on the optimistic side. Okay, this is state debt as a percentage of GDP and the various uh, precedents that we've had. Uh, I, I can, we can also include the various ministers of finance and I can say that the specific the Minister of Finance that set this whole ball rolling for this rapid increase in state debt relative to GDP was Pravin Gordon. Of course, there were a couple of other guys uh, for a short period, but the guy that really started things was there as Minister of Finance when things started going wrong was Pravin Gordon. He was the guy that uh, that uh, they kept on transferring massive amounts of our tax money to the state on enterprises. He was a guy giving well above inflation increases to the civil servants and so on. And this is the result of that. Uh, to bring this down is going to be extremely difficult. The uh, Minister of Finance thinks he's going to bring it down. I'm not so sure I believe that. Yeah, this is the comp composition of revenue. The most important revenue source for the Minister of Finance is personal income taxes at 640 billion rand. 
That's a third of total tax revenue. The second one is a quarter of tax revenue, about 24%. That's value-added taxes. And corporate income taxes at about 17, 17%. And a couple of other smaller ones. A very important one uh, is actually the fuel levy. That's that 5% over there. The fuel levy, about 80 billion annually. And that is in itself the, uh, the, the, the fourth most important revenue source to the minister uh, of finance. Uh, let me just go back for a moment, if I can. Uh, there's one at the top there that says minus 4%. That's the customs union. The South Africa collects the customs union on behalf of all the custom union countries. We will collect approximately 80 billion rand in the current financial year, and we transfer this to our neighbors. And I've run some, uh, we don't have the most recent numbers, the exact recent numbers, but this is the, gives us an indi indication on how dependent our neighbors are on this customs union transfer. In the case of Namibia, the total uh, and revenue for the Namibian government, 37% of that comes from the customs union. Of course, they contribute to the customs union as well, but South Africa is by far the biggest contrib contributor to that. So we're transferring many billions of rands to our neighbors. In the case of Lesotho, it's approximately 50%, and Swaziland, uh, Swaziland about 60% of the total revenue, Botswana also approximately a third. And of the whole pool of customs union, South Africa only gets about 7%. Our, we've calculated this on a per capita basis as well. In the case of, uh, of Namibia, the average Namibian uh, gets nearly 9,000 rand annually from the customs pool. Lesotho are nearly 4,000 rand. In the case of Swaziland, they get nearly 10,000 rand. Ten, Swaziland really, uh, the, uh, the Swazis are really coining it uh, when it comes to the customs union. Botswana, more than 9,000 rand. In South Africa, less than 1,000 rand. That, gets, that puts it a little bit in perspective. South Africa, uh, of course, contributes by far in relative terms also to the customs union, but we transfer huge amounts of money uh, to our neighbors. Uh, and they are some of the numbers. So these are a little bit old, these numbers. This is a year or two old, uh, but the, the ratios will give you, give you an indication. In fact, uh, the, uh, some countries like, for example, Swaziland will be getting more uh, in the next financial year. Now, who's doing the paying? This is uh, taxes in South Africa. This is personal income taxes. They, on the left hand side, 1.1% uh, of all personal income tax payers are equal to about 160,000 personal income taxes. 160,000 personal income tax payers in South Africa uh, pay approximately 30% of all personal income tax payers. Uh, look at the left hand side again 19% of all personal income tax payers in South Africa, which is the most important revenue source to the Minister of Finance pay 87% uh, 80, of total of all personal income taxpayers. Just imagine if one of that 163,000 individual personal income taxpayers, if they should decide to emigrate, what do you, it's got a huge impact on tax collections by the Minister of Finance. This is corporate income taxes, company taxes on the left-hand side, 0.09% of companies in South Africa. That is less than 1,000. 770 companies in South Africa pay Two thirds of all company taxes in South Africa. We are so dependent on a small number of companies for just about all our company tax collections in South Africa. And there, the graphs it, it, it speaks for itself. All right, some announcements on taxes. Uh, tax overrun in the current financial year, quite a surprise. Thanks to the much better collections by SARS, SARS is getting quite aggressive, but also because of the commodity cycle, uh, nearly 100 billion more collected on taxes. Uh, than previously estimated in the budget of the Minister of Finance. In the previous year, it was more than 100 billion. This time around, more than close to about 100 billion. But I'm afraid because of the commodity cycle turning, I don't think we're going to see uh, these kinds of overcollection. In fact, there's a possibility that tax collections could come in below the budgeted estimates. 4 billion, uh, the Minister of Finance will give us 4 billion so you can put up solar panels on your roof. You're limited to 15,000 tax break on that. It's small change in the bigger picture. I would not have done this if I was the Minister of Finance. This is just a, a, a politics and election at play. It's not really going to make much of a difference. But anyway, so four billion by way of uh, relief for people putting solar panels on their roof. Five billion for other tax and in, uh, other incentives, uh, energy incentives for companies as well. 
corporate uh, corporate company taxes and personal income taxes no adjustments in the case of personal income taxes only adjustment for 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 uh, inflation so no changes really in the real term no changes there uh, then some adjustments on the so-called sin taxes but mostly an adjustment in line with inflation which basically means that it increased by more or less with the rate of inflation about five percent or so that's for cigarettes and alcohol and those other nice things in life some other tax announcements no change in the fuel levy second year in a row i really thought that minister of finance is going to increase the fuel levy this time around he did not uh of course all taxes are always bad but the fuel levy is one of the least bad taxes just keep in mind so the fuel levy and the road accident fund levy will not be increased. So petrol price will not be increased because of this. I thought he is going to increase that. But keep in mind that the actual the deficit on the road accident fund is quite significant. So basically what is happening is that we are just postponing this liability on the road accident fund. The road accident fund is getting deeper and deeper into trouble. And eventually they will come when we will have to pay for that in any event. Um, and then there's another two-year extension on the special a diesel levy, uh, a reduction in the levy for on diesel for food manufacturers. And again, I don't like uh, if politicians use the tax system to get people to do stuff or not to do stuff. Don't use your tax system. The tax system must be as neutral as possible. Okay, where's the money going? The bulk of the money is going to education, 450 billion annually. Social protection, uh, about 380 billion. Those two expense items are both known as plus um yeah those plus social protection those three items are known as the so-called social expenditure and that in total is approximately 60 percent of total state expenditure so the bulk of state expenditure including health by the way 60 percent of total state spending goes to what is called social expenditure okay this is the pie chart where your money goes to um this is just the bottom line, the red line, is debt servicing cost, interest on state debt, while the top line is social assistance, that is basically the various grants. And at the current trajectory in 2026, 25, 26, we will be spending more on interest on state debt than on social support or social on the various grants, which means that interest will become this, the second most important expense item of the Minister of Finance. So interest is rising at a rapid rate. Uh, I have a suspicion, however, that the, the grants will be will be uh, become more of a permanent fixture. And although the Minister of Finance says that the, the so-called COVID grant will come to an end, the end of next year, I doubt that. Uh, some announcements on the expenditure. Interest as a, as a percentage of GDP, uh, as a percentage of total state expenditure, currently at about 18%, and that will increase to 19.8%. That's a, in the year 25-26. That's a huge increase on interest component. Interest component, like I've said, is a, is a single in, um, item that's increasing by far the, the quickest but, but of all expense items. That's something to be concerned about. That means that the Minister of Finance needs to cut back on other discretionary expenditure uh, and making it much more difficult for him, of course, to win the election next year. Uh, average spending on interest annually is about 370 billion annually over the next three years. The grant, uh, the COVID grant will be ex extended to, until 25, 26, and thereafter as well, I'm pretty sure. But it's supposed to come to an end 25, 26, which I doubt. Uh, grants, the grants were increased at all the other grants, but at a, a rate slightly below the inflation rate. South African Airways, and I can't believe this one, South African Airways, another billion rand will be transferred to South African Airways. And we're waiting for the semi-privatization of South African Airways, which is not going to happen, it seems, or maybe on off, we, nobody really knows. That is, I can't believe they keep on giving money to that entity. It, 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 it's dead, like they're killing the post office. So talking about the post office, we'll be getting another 2.4 billion, something like 6,000 people will lose their jobs at the post office. And they will cl close many thousands of post offices right through South Africa. And so they want to get a state bank. Doesn't make sense to me. The wage bill, the Minister of Finance uh, is budgeting for an increase of 3.3% on the wage bill. Uh, these, the trade unions are not happy. They want uh, demanding an increase of 12%. So this is another, I think, 
where the Minister of Finance will not get his target. I am pretty sure that that 3.3% will eventually be much higher than 3.3%, and the trade unions are threatening to do. They, we know they're not very productive, but we know they can be quite destructive. So I'm afraid we, we're probably going to see marches in the streets and and uh, mess in the streets, and I just hope it's not going to turn violent. This is just a calculation. The red line are the number of people receiving grants in South Africa. And of course, up to currently, there are something like 27 million, more than 27 million people receiving grants in South Africa, plus 2 million civil servants, meaning that uh, 30 million people receiving an income from the state every month. The Minister of Finance then expects the grant, this, the COVID grant to come to an end. And that's why the red line falls like that. But like I've said, I don't think that is really going to happen. If you calculate how many people's got jobs in South Africa, uh, that is the blue line, and how many people are depending on a state, then you will see for every person with a job in South Africa, there are two people receiving an income from the state. So let me repeat that. Every person with a job uh, supports two people receiving an income from the state. I understand why. We've got high levels of unemployment and poverty, and we've got a responsibility as South Africans to make sure our fellow South Africans don't die of hunger. But this is unsustainable. This is just unsustainable. The only way we can fix this is to get this economy to grow. And I'm afraid we do not see growth-friendly policies by this government. So some deficit announcements. We should uh, see a budget surplus. Give credit to the Minister of Finance. A budget surplus or, or the means that if you exclude interest payments, then we actually have a fiscal surplus and not a deficit. Well done to the Minister of Finance. Let's see if he can maintain that. So the deficit in the current year, 4.2%, and he expects that, that to bring, bring that down to 3.2% in the next financial year. I don't think he will be able to achieve that because I believe revenue will not materialize. I believe the economy, economic growth will not materialize, and I believe state spending will be higher. So I don't think that the deficit will be will come down the way that he's predicting there. That means that the debt to GDP ratio, remember now, uh, they're going to take over a lot of data from ESCOM. I'm going to give you the numbers just now. And that means that state debt relative to GDP will increase by approximately 3% relative because of the takeover from ESCOM's debt. Uh, and again, I think the debt to GDP ratio is likely to be worse than what the Minister of Finance is saying on this slide uh, because of the reasons I've just mentioned. Uh, we know the slide already, state spending to state revenue and the fiscal deficit is a gap between the two. This is the main uh, uh, main budget deficit or just the deficit, including interest, and the deficit around about 4% or so. And the Minister of Finance expects that the deficit to come to get smaller over the next couple of years. And I'm concerned about this fiscal deficit running. Even if we achieve the Minister's fiscal deficit numbers or estimates, we are still running a highly expansionary fiscal stance. Uh, this is the state's this saving. This saving simply means they borrow money. If it's okay to borrow money, as long as you spend it on capital, unfortunately, they borrow money to spend on current expenditure. And the rate uh, in the current financial year uh, of fiscal this saving, if you borrow long term money and you spend it on groceries, if you borrow money in your mortgage and you spend it on groceries, then you are destroying capital. And the capital that the state destroys is equal to approximately 2% of GDP. Long-term borrowing used to short-term current expenditure. This is the debt graph again. We know this debt graph again already. Eskom, Eskom will get debt relief of more than 250 billion rand over the three next three years. It consists of capital repayment of about 170 billion plus interest. So the combination of that two over the next three years means that Eskom's debt, 250 billion of that will be taken over by the Minister of Finance. We're waiting for more information about that. And this will increase the debt by the, the, the Minister's debt by about 3% relative to GDP. Some other announcements, uh, the Minister did mention that some legislation can be expected to address grey listing. Talk about grey listing. It seems as if the Minister has made peace with it that we are going to get grey listed. I hope that we're not going to get grey listed, but I think the Minister of Finance got some inside info and he sounded quite pretty sure that we're going to get grey listed, but he's providing, giving more money to com combat money laundering and the like. Uh, basically, the Minister, if we get grey listed, which it appears to be the case now, we will hear on Friday, uh, the Minister now is already uh, putting money aside and making some changes to certain laws to get us back on a white list again as soon as possible. The RAND took a bit of a beating, and I think this could be part of the reason for that. So grey listing is going to be bad for the economy as well. A, a few final impressions. 
This is probably as good as the minister could do. Uh, I think the minister did as good a job as possible. I think he's too optimistic on growth. Revenue is probably going to be lower. Then that means that the ratios, debt ratios and deficit ratios and state spending is probably going to move in the wrong direction. No tax increases. Yeah, the, the, the economy is simply kind of carry this tax burden as it is in any event. No real current increases. Uh, and also no real increases on discretionary spending. So let's hope he's going to be able to maintain that. I'm not so sure. I think the civil servants will be demand more than 3.3% increase. No real increase in social expenditure. Yeah, we need actually more social expenditure increase because of the high levels of unemployment, but the economy, the fiscal simply cannot afford it anymore. Uh, and further increase in interest, of course. Interest is the only expense item that will keep on going up. Um, and not enough uh, to resolve ESCOM. Like I've said, what we need to do if we want to fix ESCOM, we have to take that very, very difficult, politi politically difficult decisions and actually implement that, including firing people at ESCOM as an example and actually put it in, in business rescue. I'm afraid the measures that have been put in place are not good enough to, to save ESCOM. State-owned enterprises will remain a headache and they're getting more money. And of course, this is as close as the Minister of Finance can get to an election budget. Uh, without really blasting the fiscal accounts out of the water. So he's try, really try, keeping an eye on the budget, doing as best as they possibly could to try to please the financial markets, but at the same time to make sure that they get, that they get as many um, votes as possible in the election, but I don't think it's going to be good enough. Poverty is still, I'm very concerned about poverty, unemployment, the rising food prices, and of course all this in, uh, electioneering that we're seeing, and we will see more of that, and I'm very concerned about the possibility of public violence in South Africa. A quick asset allocation. We are asset managers, so we take people's money and we manage it. So this is just a quick asset allocation. Uh, the bonds in South Africa do provide a very attractive yield in South Africa, but only short term. I'm concerned about the longer term. Uh, local equities, again, short term, um, should be overweight in local equities. I think there are some good buys on the local equity markets. International bonds, depending which ones you are buying. Uh, but I will probably be neutral to negative in some instances. International equities, I think overweight, I think the world economy is poised for, for much stronger growth than what most analysts expect. So, and very importantly, from an individual point of view, make sure that the substantial portion of your assets are invested abroad. The rand is currently trading at 18.22 to the US dollar. This is in the calculation that we do. At 18.22, uh, the dollar is quite expensive or the rand is quite weak. Uh, based on our calculations. So it's quite possible that the rand can drift back a little bit, come down to 17 or even below 17. But because of factors like I've mentioned, things like, for example, we have very weak economic growth. And those are some of the reasons and the possibility of gray listing why the rand has, is currently under pressure. But uh, based on our, our, the way we calculate the, the correct exchange rate of the currency, the rand is actually too weak at the moment. I did mention... I will show you this QR code again. This is the QR code. Take your telephone. Take a picture of this. I'm going to leave this here. Take a picture of this, and uh, it will. you will follow, follow all the steps, and you can get my presentation as well. You can send me an email if you want to as well and all that. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening to me. And if there are any questions, Francois, he just walked into the studio. So, Francois, if there are any questions, uh, you can. I will try to answer the questions. Shoot, Francois, what are the questions? Great. So the first question, will the war ever end? Will the war ever end? I guess that's a reference to the war in Ukraine. I think this war is going to go on for a very, very long period of time. Uh, I, I think, um, yeah, so I don't think it's going to end soon. Uh, it can get much worse. It, it can suck in a lot of other countries as well. And it can actually turn nuclear as well. I don't think so. But there, there certainly is a possibility there were some threats already about the possibility of a nuclear war. But I think the most likely scenario is a protracted war that's going to go on for quite a long period of time and it can be quite disruptive. The next question, what impacts do you foresee if there is no ESCOM? What Im impact? So if the ESCOM comes com com to a complete standstill or total blackout, for example, that's going to be disastrous for the South African economy. What is happening is that we are rapidly moving away from ESCOM and we are putting alternatives in place, but we're not ready for that yet. So if ESCOM should come to a complete back out overnight, 
it will be disastrous to the South African economy. The rand's going to bomb out. Economic growth is going to collapse. But eventually, what is going to happen? We're going to privatize Eskom like we've privatized, or in the process of privatizing everything that the, the state is currently running. Right. Here's a multiple choice. Now I'm just getting a couple of questions from Corne. With the outlook of continued recessions looming, will this continue to put pressure on unemployment? Yes, I'm afraid unemployment in South Africa, as we know, is very, very high. Uh, even if we grow the economy at the rate of population growth, that is not good enough. We need to grow the economy to 3% above population growth if we really want to make a dent in unemployment. So, And we're not going to see economic growth of 2 or 3 or 4% in South Africa for a very long time. And that inevitably means that unemployment levels will remain elevated and might um, it's likely to even go up again. As well, so I'm I'm concerned about that. I agree. And just a follow up question on that: If unemployment is increasing, the impact on inflation and interest rates? Uh, unemployment actually going up means, and weak economic growth in itself is disinflationary. So weak economic growth will actually slow inflation down as well. Of course, weak economic growth may indirectly also lead to a much weaker currency, which in itself could be inflationary. But weak economic growth in itself uh, usually means that uh, inflation. Uh, will increase at a slightly slower rate. So high levels of unemployment will unfortunately also probably contribute to lower inflation. I think you spend enough time on America. Uh, the question is specifically on the American markets. Aren't we being too optimistic about the American economy? No, I think the US economy is a miracle economy. And not only the US economy, I think there are many economic activities happening internationally and locally for that matter, that economies are simply not, economists are simply not capable of measuring. Uh, and there are many examples of that. So I actually think the world economic growth is stronger than what we think, and that includes a U.S. economic growth as well. So I'm actually quite an optimist when it gets to economic growth. Uh, Christian on the team is a tongue-in-cheek question. The new minister of electricity, can we see at the right of surprise? <laughs> I don't think the writer is going to be the Minister of Finance. There's no way. He's, he's been far too critical uh, on some of the interviews that I've uh, watched uh, of him. So, no, and I'm pretty sure he's not going to make a mistake like this again. <laughs> I agree, I agree. Um, good day, Darby. Is the projected economic growth higher for the actual 22-23 year than predicted last year? Is there some magic growth? which one cannot account for. Yes, I did mention that there's a lot of economic activities that economists are just not capable of measuring. But if you compare economic growth by the Minister of Finance, let's have a, perhaps, let me answer your question this way. For the past 10 years, uh, economic growth uh, estimated by the Minister of Finance in eight of the 10 years were lower than what the Minister of Finance estimated. And only two years was higher than what the Minister of Finance estimated. The one year was in 2021 because of us getting out of COVID. So there's a bit of a technical reason for that. And this year, again, is uh, politicians always tells us next year is going to be better. Next year is going to be better. Next year usually isn't better. This is an interesting question from Dave Woolen. Assuming there is political will, what are the three largest implementable and practical policy changes? that could cumulatively add 2% to GDP? 2% to GDP? Uh, I'm afraid there's nothing that we can do to add 2% to economic growth in the short term. Uh, there are many things that we can do to add 2% and 3% and 4% and 5% to economic growth in the medium longer term. And Dave, perhaps uh, I've got a list of uh, my uh, policy benchmarks. Just go through those. Those are the kind of things that we can do to get the economy to grow faster. There's much, however, that we can do to change sentiment in South Africa. Now, we can change sentiment if the president gets up, for example, and say that, listen, from now on, the, the country is going to be first and not the ANC, for example. Um, and uh, I think, uh, and maybe I can make a comment here about sentiment as well. There's a theory, the so-called broken window theory, and I'm sure you all know about this. What we need in South Africa is a quick, easy win. Sentiment at the moment is very low in South Africa. All kinds of sentiment, consumer sentiment, business sentiment, investment, all, and there are many various indices measuring sentiment. It is very low. We need a win. We need an easy win to change sentiment in South Africa. And what I suggest are two easy things that's not going to cost us money, Everybody will support. It's pretty much guaranteed if you do it properly that it's going to be a success. And if you make a success, you will have an easy one. And here are the two suggestions. One is, is that simply 
uh, clean the place up. Get everybody to clean the place up. up. Clean South Africa up. It's a dirty place. Clean it up. The president must stand up in front of everybody and say, listen, every Saturday morning, we're going to walk in your neighborhood and you're going to pick up the dirt and you're going to clean the place up, including the president and his sons, which I think is currently in the United States, by the way. Uh, so that's one. Clean the place up. Everybody will support that. And it will you can see it and it will be a success and everybody will feel happier. The second one is simply implement the, the traffic rules. We've got very high levels of uh, people dying on the roads. Just implement the traffic rules. We've got the laws. We're supposed to have the speed cops. Uh, we're supposed to have the budgets for all of this. Just implement that. Bring the death toll down on the roads. Everybody will feel better about that. And the president will be, will be in a position to brag and say, listen, we've achieved something. So that's a short term something that we can do to improve sentiment. And that in itself eventually will improve economic growth as well. But in the short term, there really is nothing major that we can do. Or maybe something else that we can do as well, and that is to transfer property uh, to the poor. People that live in state uh, and, and in this, uh, and state uh, property, for state houses, for example, transfer that en masse uh, to the poor. It's not going to do much to economic growth. Uh, on the margin, it is. Uh, but at least that's another feel-good factor, something that we can do as well. But I'm afraid this economy is not going to grow two per, plus 2% for... Uh, two percent faster. It doesn't matter what we do in the short term. Question from Herman Now, which sectors or companies will benefit from this budget? Will benefit most from this budget? Benefit most from this budget? <laughs> the solar panel guys, I guess, they will benefit from this. Uh, I I think uh, in a case, I think transport uh, related companies could benefit from this as well. Not only because of the budget, but some other announcements that have been made, like for example, to get more private sector participation. I think companies, so I mentioned companies in the electricity industries, uh, but apart from that, uh, I can't, I think some manufacturers that manufacture, especially foodstuffs, they can benefit because of the subsidy on, on, on fuel. Uh, but apart from that, I can't specifically think of um, industries that will benefit from this. Uh, industries that could be negatively affected by gray listing could be the financial industries. So banks and the like, if you are grain listed, and I suspect now it's going to happen, it seems like it, then the financial industries, uh, banks and so on, are likely to be affected negatively. Your take on the SMMEs, uh, can they create the jobs that we need if they are better looked after in terms of the laws, bylaws? Yeah. Uh, uh, small businesses do not contribute much to the economy. Small businesses are not taxpayers. I've showed you the graph. Small businesses fail, mostly. Small businesses do not employ people. Small businesses exist uh, because people don't have a, another choice quite often. So small businesses are not that important. Small businesses are important for one reason, and that is small businesses can hopefully become eventually medium-sized and big businesses eventually. So we need to support, for that reason, small businesses need support. But not only small businesses, all businesses need support in South Africa, and not support in a, by way of, of, of uh, uh, subsidies, as an example, but support from a government that, do, well, that does what a government is supposed to be doing. Get crime down, fix the potholes, fix, clean the place up, fix the traffic, that sort of stuff. Uh, but uh, small businesses, to be honest, don't really contribute that much to economic growth. It doesn't mean they're not important, but they're important because they can eventually become big. But the contribution of small businesses to the economy is actually quite small. Great. An interesting question also from um, Carmen Swanepoel about the, the child grants. Would it make a difference if South Africa also instituted a child limit like they did in China? Yeah, that's a, I, I disagree with that. A child limit is the question. Should we introduce a child limit so you can only have so many children? Uh, if you have more children, you can't receive the child support grant. I disagree with that. But I do agree that we should do what the Brazilians are doing and introduce a couple of means tests, small means tests, when it comes to the child support grant. Like, for example, you have to prove that the kid is going to school, that the child's got a certain weight, as an example, that the child has been inoculated, that kind of stuff. And what I, I, what I think we should also include in the case of South Africa is that the child's father's name was, must be included on the child's birth certificate and the mother must prove that, that the mother 
uh, try to get the support from the father first before she can apply for the child support grant. Those are the kind of measures that I think we should can and should put in place. But to say, listen, if you get more than a number of children, we're not going to give you a child support grant anymore. I think that is wrong. Um, if the objective is to get to reduce population growth, the best way to reduce population growth is to get the economy to grow, and that will happen in any event. And anyway, in the case of South Africa, all just about all places in the world, not everywhere, but in the case of South Africa, certainly a population growth, the rate of population growth is in any event slowing down. A question from Willem. Uh, we only mentioned some of the asset classes that we are overweight on, equities, bonds, et cetera. Yeah. He's saying what would be would be underweight on? Probably cash and property. Then. Uh, I'm not a great fan of property, so I will probably be underweight a little bit on property and I will be underweight. But remember, these are the, the asset allocation that we've uh, that we've given there. Uh, for example, I will probably be underweight in Japanese bonds, as an example. I will be underweight on European bonds, as an example. I will, for now, probably be underweight uh, American bonds as well, but soon I might uh, turn around. So it really depends on what specific asset class you're talking about. But I think property I'm not very keen on. And if you underweight on everything, then or overweight on everything, then you have to be underweight on cash. And nothing was said about the national health insurance. Yes. Interesting one. Nothing much said about the national health insurance. Well, obviously, we ran out of money. The money is finished in class. So that's one reason why we're not going to see the NHI. Uh, realizing soon, but there's another reason why we're not going to see the NHI. It's and that's a good thing of having a government that is very incompetent. They also cannot implement a bad idea. This is a bad idea. Uh, question on the currency. Our prediction for the next month or so. We uh, prediction on the currency. Uh, Francois and I we debate this quite a, quite a lot, and I think I agree with Francois. I think the rand is overdone. I think the rand can appreciate a little bit over the next couple of months. But if the question is, when should I take my money out of the country? The answer to that is you take your money out of the country when you, when you make the decision. Don't try to play the currency. Don't play, try to play the exchange rate. You're not going to get it right. You talked a lot about the gray list. There's just a follow-up question from Sean. Uh, the impact possibly on exchange rate and interest rate. Yes, if we see the grey listing, we're not going to immediately see an impact on the grey on on the economy. Uh, but what we're probably going to see gradually over time is that it will be much more expensive for, for money, basically for money to move in and out of South Africa. That means for trade purposes as well as for, for investment purposes. Uh, putting making it just a schlep to move money in and out of South Africa. It's already a schlep to move money in and out of South Africa. It will become more expensive, and that means foreigners probably will think twice before they do business with South Africa and before they invest in South Africa as well. Uh, so there's another obstacle. And that means it's probably going to be negative for the exchange rate, negative for, for, for inflation, which means that the Reserve Bank will have to keep monetary policy tighter for longer. It's not a train smash, depending how quick we can get back on a whitelist again. And it is possible to get back on a whitelist within months, but it depends on your political leadership. Uh, good question from Komotso. Can this war signify the introduction of a new world order? The new world order? <laughs> Komotsa, thanks for that. We're always seeing a new world order, but there is a, there is, there is a new world order in a way happening. Uh, what, is, what is happening is that the U.S. economy is still by far the biggest economy in the world, but uh, the second biggest economy in the world. In fact, the Chinese economy, depending on you measure that, is already bigger than the U.S. economy if you adjust it for purchasing power parity as an example. So from that point of view, uh, the the last the, the past hundred years was certainly without a doubt the American century. Uh, that this the next hundred years is not going to be the American century. The past say, thirty years was certainly the Chinese thirty years, and we're going to see more of the Chinese over the next twenty thirty years. But I think the the new growth engine in the world is going to be the Indians. The Indian economy is going to shoot their, their lights out. Depending, of course, if they get their politics right, so there are some challenges there as well. So, yes, in a way, we're seeing a new world order, but this is nothing new. The world always changes, and this is not going to be the last change. We will we will always see changes in the world. 100 years ago, the most important currency in the world was the British pound, and it was taken over by the US dollar. And now we see the euro is also becoming more important. The remember is more becoming more and more important. And talking about the, the American dollar, I think the US dollar will be with us for quite some time still to come. But the day will eventually come when I mean, the US dollar will be replaced by something else as well. And I think that something, something else is going to be a central bank digital currency, by the way. Uh, Cornet asked a question. Uh, 
in terms of our overweight local equities compared to foreign equities. I don't think that we're saying stop investing offshore. I'm just saying there are opportunities. In yeah, the yeah, no, no, I think what we are saying, remember, South African companies are basically international companies. So there are many South African companies that uh, really uh, are, I think, quite attractive. Uh, so, But there are international companies as well. I think the answer to that is, is not to, to look at the South African market or the international markets, but rather look at the, the various companies. Uh, and that's how we manage our assets in any event. We look at companies and we don't necessarily look at the regions. That's not that important to us. Output for foreign direct investment, which sectors, if any, will receive Yes, the uh, uh, FDI foreign direct investments into South Africa, uh, there are really amazing opportunities in South Africa. Unfortunately, the politicians do not want to let go. For example, if we uh, if we get allow more private sector participation in 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 the railroads, as an example. There are huge opportunities for FDI investments in the railroads in South Africa. The same goes for electricity, obviously. So announce that we're going to get rid of ESCOM and gradually phase ESCOM out. And we want foreigners and locals to invest in South Africa in electricity generation and distribution. You can see huge inflows of capital into South Africa and many other places. Infrastructure is collapsing. Uh, in South Africa, and if we allow foreign participation and local participation, there certainly are opportunities. Unfortunately, we've got a government that's ideologically just not there. Uh, we talk; uh, They keep on talking about the silly things like developmental state. They call one another comrade. I mean, that's embarrassing. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they got stuck somewhere in the 1920s. So they think they can run the economy if they can't. Open up the economy, and you will see a lot of foreign uh, direct investment coming into the South Africa. I'm not holding my breath. Oliver is asking about the comment you made on the solar panels and the uh, tax relief that government wants to give. Why is that not a good idea to give tax relief? Okay, uh, the reason why I say I'm not in, by the way, is we're talking small change. We're talking 4 billion rand only, uh, which is a lot of money, but we, uh, the total state spending runs in hundreds of billions. Uh, the, the reason why I say it's not a good idea, one of the requirements for a good tax system is, a, is neutrality. Do not use your tax system to get people to do stuff or not to do stuff. And this is an example how you distort the tax system. Uh, and the state is also not supposed to get involved in these kind of things. The state is supposed to be involved in primary things, like in law and order, and perhaps education, and maybe some infrastructure. The state is not the responsibility for the state to get involved in things like, for example, solar panels on my roof. Um, if the state really wants to support me as an individual, then get out of electricity altogether and the economy will grow faster and I will find a job and put on my own solar system. I don't need state support for that. So don't use the fiscus to get people to do these fine sort of things. All these fine, don't try to fine tune the economy with either the revenue side or the expense side of the fiscus. So it's a theoretical reason for that, mostly. Mornay is asking, do you think government can get corruption under control and curb state capture? Can government get, get corruption under control? The answer is no. <laughs> I like that. Short and sweet. Uh, Billy Hansen from the Rijksburg. What are the chances for a coalition between the ANC and the EFF? And what will the effect be on the economy and the policies? Okay, here's my view on uh, the elections. If the ANC gets 45% or more, which is the most likely scenario, they can go into a coalition with the smaller political parties, which is perhaps the best case scenario for South Africa. If the ANC gets less than 45%, or maybe, maybe even as low as 40%, then they won't have a choice but to go into coalition with the EFF. If that should happen, then I'm afraid the financial markets are gonna punish us. Uh, that's not a good partner to have in government. Uh, if the ANC gets well below 40%, there is a possibility, that the other uh, opposition parties can somehow put to together a coalition government, but that is highly unlikely. I think the most likely scenario is for the EFF, for the ANC to get 45 or a little bit more, meaning a coalition be between the ANC and the other smaller political parties. And Johan is asking, uh, in general, your positive takeaways. What do you feel? Yes, I cover a couple of positives. The one is that the Minister of Finance is at least planning. Whether he's going to be successful in that is another question. But for a fiscal uh, primary surplus, that's excluding interest rates. So he's really trying hard to keep a lid on discretionary spending. That is without a doubt a positive. Whether he's going to be successful is, of course, another question. I think this is the best that the, the Minister can do under circumstances, given under political circumstances, one should add as well. So that is another, uh, I guess, a positive, if you like. I must say, listening to the minister, 
He's, out, he's got self-confidence. You need that in the minister. And I think the minister, Enokon Nguana, is, is the best that the ANC can offer. If that is good news, then I guess that is a bit of a silver lining. And then uh, if you, <laughs> another kind of a silver lining, I guess, is that the state is collapsing. And that, in a way, is creating a lot of opportunities for the private sector. Uh, electricity is only one example. So we know, for example, Gwede Mantash was kicking and screaming and didn't want to allow the private sector to generate electricity. And he hasn't got a choice now but to allow the private sector more and more uh, to generate more and more electricity. That's that's an example where reality is catching up with the ANC. And I think reality will catch up more with the ANC over the next couple of years. And they, they will be forced to get the private sector uh, to participate in all these things that from now on, uh, until now, they wanted to monopolize. And ESCOM is an excellent example of that. From Jimmy, do, do we have an idea of what percentage of people are paying for electricity? Those who use it compared to those who pay for it. Have you seen a statistic on that? No, I don't have a percentage on that. I would certainly guess that the significant, I think ESCOM actually has got that numbers. Uh, but I would say that a significant percentage of people that are supposed to be paying for electricity simply do not. Uh, Mike is saying that in the past we said that if you have 100 Rand invest, 90 Rand abroad, and only keep 10 Rand here. Uh, I don't think we, we said that. No. We, no. Uh, so how much should you invest abroad? And that depends on who you are. We all have different uh, individuals. All individuals have got uh, various different priorities, different risk profiles, and different requirements. So the best that you can do, contact one of Efficient's financial advisors, and we can give you the best advice, financial advice on how much you should invest abroad. Marius is also noting something important. It doesn't seem there was any mention made of the dysfunctional municipalities in South Africa. No, the Minister of Finance did actually mention the dysfunctional municipalities in South Africa, and he's making a transfer to those dysfunctional municipalities. That is a major problem in South Africa. That's a major problem. The municipalities is by, are by far the most important uh, authority because that is your first contact as a business person uh, with, with a, an authority, and that's your local municipality. Uh, they give you electricity. It's supposed to give you electricity and water and, um, and uh, infrastructure and stuff like that. And the Minister of Finance actually increased the transfer to the, to the local authorities. But the local authorities, they are a complete and a total mess. Something like 70% of them are financially just not viable. Can big business form a pressure group? And demand action from Cyril? Yeah, uh, typically, uh, can big business uh, form a pressure group? That's not that's not uh, what business does. Uh, internationally, you don't really get that. Business, business is in the business of doing business. Business typically do not put as a group that much pressure on government. Having said that, there are more and more pressure groups, without a doubt, in South Africa, putting more and more pressure on government. There are a lot of social... Uh, uh, civil service, civil uh, uh, social groups, and I can think of many of them. And recently, there are some business groups as well, putting more and more business pressure on government. But that's typically not the culture of business uh, to form pressure groups. But we, we do see some of that in South Africa. But I, I'm not going to look at business uh, to get government to, to change some of their policies. Maybe a little bit outside of our February, but the uh, property market is it a good time to invest? Good time to invest in property uh, for in, an investment. I'm not a great fan of property for various reasons. Uh, one is uh, there are some benefits in property. One is you can give property. Other one is it keeps usually up with inflation. So those, those are the positives. And of course, if you buy a, a, a nice beach house, you can take beautiful pictures of the family there. That is, and don't don't knock that. Some people like that. Some people like fast cars. Some people like. That, that's the reason why you live. You can you can sometimes spoil yourself and your family. There's nothing wrong with that. But um, there are a lot of downside to property. It's very expensive. Transaction cost is very, very high. The liquidity is very low. Uh, maintenance cost is very high. So there are a lot of downside to, to property. If you want to invest in property, rather invest in listed property. I would prefer that. But in the meantime, you've got to stay somewhere. So buy a house, look around and find a good and a nice place to say that's perhaps not a bad place to start. But as an investment, I prefer listed property. Uh, James is asking about the retirement reform. There wasn't any mention of the two-part system. I don't... No, there was something on the retirements, but I haven't really looked into that yet. But there was not much because then I would have picked it up. So no, I don't think significant changes on the retirement reform. That is probably still coming. 
Uh, Gunther is just saying thank you for uh, the, the insights. This is one of the many that says saying thank you. Uh, Dave is asking if BRICS increasingly becomes an anti USD club, will our continued allegiance to this grouping hurt our trade with the West? Yeah, I'm afraid it's probably hurting our trade with the West already. Um, I've spoken to some, of course, they won't say this in public, but I've spoken to some diplomats, Western diplomats, and they are concerned about things like for South Africa military exercises with, um, with the Chinese, as an example. So yes, um, the Europeans and, and the Americans are by far our most important investors and trading partners, while the other BRICS country members are not that important to us. By the way, BRICS are likely to get much, much bigger soon. And we could include countries like, for example, Saudi Arabia, Turkey wants to join BRICS, uh, some other countries, Argentina wants to break, uh, join BRICS, and some are big Eastern economies, other Eastern economies also want to use uh, join BRICS. So BRICS is probably going to, and I think it's not a bad idea for South Africa to remain a member of BRICS, but I think South Africa must really, if we say, if we, say we are neutral on something, then we really have to be neutral. I understand neutrality, but we really have to be neutral, and sometimes I get the impression that we are not really that neutral. Just a couple of topics. Um... Topis is saying hello and he's agreeing with your assessment of uh, moving debt from the one to the other government institution. Thank you, Takis. And then an uh, interesting comment here, which I think we agree with about primary schools. Uh, they're saying that we also think teachers' training colleges should be brought back. Good idea. And that the Minister of Education should be held accountable um, uh, for the grades and the passing rates of the individuals. Yeah, uh, I think we can, uh, yes, I agree with that in principle, but I think we can make more use of uh, private sector uh, education in South Africa, a voucher system as an example, yeah. Mo Monia Erasmus is asking, what about AI, the impact on our economy? And yeah, that's part of the reason why I think the world economy is actually doing much better than what we think because of things like, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but the technological advances and artificial intelligence certainly is part of that. Are we done, Francois? There are a few here. Opinion on Joburg taking on ETOLs. We're getting to the last part of it. Yeah, it's not Joburg uh, taking on ETOLs. It's actually a Gauteng province. An amount of 30 billion was already transferred last year to Sonral. And the rest, I believe, the Gauteng government still has to find somewhere. So the ETOLs are coming to an end. But that's actually a form of tax revolt. From Chris Hutton, the continuation of the social relief or distress grant, isn't it simply just another basic income grant? Yes, I actually think uh, the social, the COVID grant will eventually morph into a basic income grant, yes. Yes, did say that, so I think we're almost through it. Okay. So from my side, I think, Francois, thank you very much for those questions. Uh, thank you to you, to everybody for those questions. And thank you very much for, for listening to me. Uh, I hope this was of value. And again, take a picture of this and you can get my the presentation as well. And uh, thank you again to my team, Francois and Wilhelmine especially, but Alay also and her team for making all of this possible. Thank you very much to the whole of Efficient making this possible. This was quite a, quite a, a lot of work that we've put in here to make sure that we can bring this to you in time. Thank you very much for listening to me. My name is Davi Ruth. I'm the Chief Economist at Efficient Group and I still... I hope I, I hope I still got that job after this presentation. <laughs>